happening today. St. Louis University is set to announce a new president. This five year plan looks really rough for thousands of Illinois families. In the last week, there have been four homicides and nine drive by shootings all in the city of St. Louis. This is the intersection in question. There's a red light camera right over here, right over there. But as we zoom out, check out what is right next to me. Happening today, a new warning from police in the Metro East. Officers will be on the lookout for drunk drivers, speeders, and anyone not wearing a seatbelt. This is the way his officers will now do business. And then with those huge winds. This is where it ended up. I can slide just by pushing my hands so you can imagine just how slick that is. Free beer. That's what a thief sees whenever you leave things in your car. So here's the thing. They're going to be pumping up patrols because all too often they have people go to Forest Park and leave things like this in their front seat. Going through the surveillance video to figure out how these guys got in. It's been about three weeks of constant phone calls, text messages and emails with IDOT officials because I wanted to know just how many people are using fake tax returns all filed from the same area. Now Lee police searching for a clever con man. People are getting ready inside. Then they run outside quickly. They get in their car for just a second. It is gorgeous yeah, outside right now. Awesome for a Monday in January, right? Katie, you're saying that's yeah. going to be a different store. <laughs> $500,000 to help transform this Metrolink station into a stop for that high speed rail. <laughs> it's pretty hot. <laughs> Oh, whoa, it's really hot. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. What we often can't report is the victim's story. Laura Hedegger joins us live from the Central West End. And Laura, you cover a lot of crime, but today's story a little different. I sure do, Andre. And in fact, I've covered 58 deaths just this year. And I keep count of that number for a couple of reasons. One, to better track crime and crime trends, and two, in hopes of following up with those families. And that's what I'm doing today with the story of Kenneth Watkins. I need to tell you, it was actually a police officer who told me about this 22-year-old father who should just be waking up for his final day of college classes. Instead, I wound up meeting his mother, who told me that his life was cut short right inside this apartment building all because of senseless gun violence. And I just always told him to be careful, you know, just be careful out there because people are crazy. And his thing is, I'd be okay, Mom. We first told you about Angela Walken's son, Kenneth, in early July. Instead of sharing happier times like his graduation from Kirkwood High School. The crime of murder is shaking up. Our cameras brought you here to the 5500 block of Pershing in the Central West End. This is where he was murdered. He wasn't even out in the streets. He was in his apartment. Someone killed Watkins one day before he was supposed to move out of his first apartment. My last weekend. I say, yeah, this is your last weekend here. Angela tells me she remembers almost everything about that last weekend of June, especially the first thing doctors told her. They said there was nothing they can do. Angela is now raising Kenneth's son, her grandson. She says Kenneth's death is even more unfortunate because he was just months away from becoming a police officer. Something even more remarkable because one of his best friends says he was a former gang member. That was one of our main connections was the fact that we both used to uh, be in the streets. He was uh, he was a blood and I was a crip and it was kind of weird that we actually were able to come together and be friends. Police, family, and friends also say what really stood out about Kenneth was his drive to make his life better. That was his motivation as well, taking care of his mom, his son, you know, his sister. And he always, that's what he always talked about. I got to do this. I'm going to make it. And unfortunately for all the people this future police officer could have touched and helped, Kenneth is now made into a crime statistic. He is homicide number 49 out of 90 in the city of St. Louis. And city police tell me there have not been any arrests in this case. Live in the Central West End, Laura Hedegaard, News 4.
The only thing more disturbing than a child's murder is learning that a family member is indeed charged with the crime. Laura Hedegar, I know that you've been talking to people who know this family well. What are they saying? Well, Sharon, we have been here all day in Watson since 7 o'clock this morning. We've been talking to volunteers, neighbors, authorities, and investigators. But I'll tell you, it's those family friends, the ones who say they knew the family who lived here before Willow disappeared that really gave us an idea of who this family is. They were a very close-knit family that um, Debbie, she, her children were her whole life. Uh, Willow was the grandma's whole life. Today, that close-knit family must come to terms that one of their own, 22-year-old Justin DeRyke, is the man police say killed little Willow Long, his own niece. Tina Sapp is a close family friend and neighbor of the DeRikes. So knowing them on a personal level has actually been real, real hard. She says Debbie and Dale DeRike, Willow's living grandparents, alerted her and her husband, the town mayor, about the seven-year-old's disappearance before they called the authorities. She also says Justin DeRike was the last person to see Willow alive. As the search ended and the criminal investigation started, we had to know if all these volunteers spent two days searching for a little girl that someone inside her own home knew would never come back home. Do you think someone took her out of the home or do you think it was someone in the home? I really don't know. I've had thoughts both ways. So I, I don't want to think the bad way considering I know the family and it's really hard for me to think and believe that someone inside the home had something to do with it. But there again, knowing Willow, she wouldn't have ventured off very, very far on her own. And just within the last 10 minutes, I had a chance to speak with Willow's grandfather. That is Justin's father. And he told us quite a story of what he says happened to his granddaughter. And Sharon News 4 is working very hard to confirm to confirm that story once we do of course we'll pass it along to everyone on news 4 and also our website kmov.com all right laura could be quite a bombshell you'll get back to us right, laura hedegar tracked down the head of transportation to find out if your kids are safe on the school bus laura and jasmine this is exactly where that bus fire happened you can see all the damage it did to the grass around me so yeah you can tell this was a major fire but get this i found out the bus involved is only three years old and it had been inspected and approved to be on these roads as recently as last tuesday so how in the world could this happen just two days later as far as we know flames were coming out of the bottom of the bus and in seconds, this happened. Flames under the bus, flames shooting through it, and a plume of black smoke billowing into the air. Right now we're working on determining, you know, what exactly happened, what exactly occurred. Tammy Webb is the head of transportation for VIC, a nonprofit spinoff from the desegregation program. She says this bus passed an inspection this year, and just Tuesday, it was approved to be on the road. I asked her, based on this video, should all 240 Durham buses in their fleet be re-inspected. It seems odd that if it was approved on Tuesday, then this happens on Thursday. Well, again, until we determine what was the situation, um, you know, what exactly caused um, the situation, that you know, then we'll take a look at, at what what occurred. Now it's up to Durham bus officials to go through the shell of this bus and figure out how this happened. I would hate to speculate on um, what exactly occurred because it, again, I you know, at this time we don't know. A lot of unknowns remain in this investigation, especially just how much time passed between when the last student was dropped off and when those flames ripped through this bus. I'll explain why that spokesperson can't give me an answer to that and also what the driver heard right before that fire happened. Coming up all new on News 4 at 6. Reporting live in North St. Louis, Laura Hedegar, News 4.